Thanks, man. Thanks, man. Yep. Thanks, man. Um, the next uh, talk is going to be by Dr. Benjamin Hirschberg. Uh, the title of the talk is uh, ring, the ring Amp, the Scalable Amplifier We've All Been Waiting For. So uh, Dr. Hirschberg earned his PhD from Oregon State, uh, in 2000, Oregon State University in 2012, introducing the idea of ring amplification at ISC the same year. Since 2013, he's been with IMEC at Leuven, Belgium, uh, doing a research on a variety of topics covering the full receiver change from the antenna down to the ADC. Um, his obsession with ring camp still continues today, and his current research interests include uh, uh, tackling the final challenges of industrialization and looking for opportunities to ring camp to solve open challenges in ADC. Um, Dr. Hirschberg, please. And then can you push the talk as well? I appreciate it. Thanks for joining me today. In the world of switched capacitor signal processing, ring amps are starting to grab some attention. Year after year at ISCCC and other top conferences, they're helping to break ADC performance records and advance the state of the art. There's a lot of hype and interest surrounding the topic, but also quite a bit of skepticism, confusion, and misconceptions. In this talk, I hope to bring some clarity to all of this. I'm going to start by motivating the need for ring amps and then dive into fundamentals and basic principles of operation. With that foundation in place, we'll then look at how to choose the best ring amp topology for a given application. And after that, I'll walk you through a decision tree for how to optimize your ring amp towards any particular performance priority, such as higher speed or higher accuracy. Finally, we're gonna tie it all together in a practical design example and discuss how to design and validate in cadence. To motivate the general need for new amplification solutions in advanced technologies, I'd like to begin with a look at some of the clear scaling trends that we can observe in ADCs. As designers have moved into nanoscale technology nodes, some ADC architectures clearly downscaled better than others. Perhaps more than any other, the SAR ADC has been particularly successful, delivering the state of the art across an incredibly wide range of applications, from ultra low speed biomedical and sensors up to ultra high speed wireline. On the other hand, many ADC architectures that once dominated large regions of the ADC application space have been pushed to the fringes. For example, pipeline ADCs were once considered the solution for high-speed ADCs above a certain resolution. Now interleaf SARS have taken over much of that performance space. Pipelines are still dominant in certain applications like direct RF sampling, but this is not so much a fact of pipelines performing particularly well in that performance category as it is a consequence of SAR ADCs performing rather poorly in that space. So what's the reason for this discrepancy? Why have some architectures done better than others? The simple answer is amplifiers. Conventional op amps have not downscaled well into nanoscale CMOS, and this has led to a clear efficiency bottleneck. Conventionally, the more amplifier intensive an architecture is, the less competitive it will be in nanoscale CMOS, both with regard to power efficiency and raw performance. But it also must be asked, should we even care about this amplifier bottleneck? If we're making progress with certain amplifier-free solutions, why not just focus on developing those and retire linear amplifiers along with the architectures that depend on them altogether? There are, in fact, many in the field that argue exactly this. Uh, but I think it's a rather short-sighted philosophy. Diversity is always a good thing. The more tools we have in our circuit designer toolbox, the better. Not only does it provide more freedom for creativity in solving existing applications and problems, it can also help to expand the boundaries of performance to new limits beyond what is currently possible. A good example here is the emergence of pipelined SAR ADCs. At some point, people realized that by adding some amplification and residue gain into the SAR algorithm, you could expand the application space of SARs to significantly higher speeds. The key lesson there is that however successful a technique is without amplifiers, it can potentially become even more powerful with them. Ultimately, I think we're gonna be far better off if we do solve the amplifier scaling problem. Whether people in the field fully realize it or not, it's probably one of the most profound constraints on design freedom that we face. Now, none of this is by any means a particularly new realization. And to the contrary, over the last two decades, there has been considerable research activity focused on finding a general purpose solution to high efficiency amplification in nanoscale technologies, and more specifically in discrete time switched capacitor circuits. 
which encompass not only ADCs, but many other baseband signal processing blocks as well. Any viable candidate must be able to operate in low supply voltages and provide linear amplification despite low intrinsic device gain and linearity. I'm showing a few of the most popular and successful candidates here, but this is just a subset of the ideas that have been proposed over the years. While most of them can improve certain aspects of performance or scalability, none are able to check off all of the items on this ideal amplifier wish list across all the metrics of speed, accuracy, cost, and efficiency. That's the real challenge, the holy grail of a general purpose solution. For example, a GMC or dynamic open loop amplifier does quite well in terms of speed and efficiency, but it's rather uh, limited in terms of output swing, gain, and linearity. For very specific applications like pipeline SARS, these limitations can be accommodated, it's possible to work around them, but it disqualifies it as a candidate for a general purpose solution. And this brings us to the main topic of our talk today, the idea of a ring amplifier or ring amp. It's yet another idea that attempts to tick off all of the items on the wish list. But the fascinating thing here is it actually succeeds at doing so. It's perhaps the closest we've come yet to a truly general purpose scalable amplifier. And I think that's what makes it an exciting topic to discuss. So in this talk, I'm going to try to give you an idea of what exactly a ring amplifier is, how it works, why it works so well, how to design one, and how to develop a ring amp topology that is best for your application. I'm going to start with some ring amp fundamentals and go over the basic principle of operation. To begin with, consider what happens if we put a three inverter ring oscillator into a switch capacitor feedback structure. Notice that we've made a modification in addition to the three inverter stages, there's also a reset switch and a capacitor. And during reset, uh, this will store the input referred offset of this uh, first stage inverter onto the capacitor, such that the trip point of the three inverter ring oscillator will be approximately VCMX or 0.6 volts in this uh, example. So after sampling some input signal onto the input capacitor and then uh, configuring the MDAC into a feedback configuration, uh, what we'll see in simulation is that uh, the ring oscillator is going to drive its input node VN, shown here in blue, uh, towards its trip point. That's the basic principle of feedback operation. But because it's an oscillator, it's going to then continue oscillating around that trip point and never actually manage to settle into the final target value. But if we ignore for a moment the problem of being an oscillator and just think of it uh, uh, in terms of an amplifier and consider its properties in that sense, uh, it actually looks quite attractive. Uh, we can generate large open loop gain by cascading multiple inverter stages. Uh, we can generate rail to rail output swing we have extremely high slewing efficiency due to the uh, large transient swings uh, of biasing inside of the oscillator. Uh, we can make a small, simple, compact layout. Uh, it has uh, inherent class AB uh, biasing uh, behavior and, and uh, properties, so it's quite dynamic uh, in its uh, power consumption. And it's fully compatible with digital CMOS because we're just chaining together a bunch of inverters. So from that perspective, actually, it sounds great uh, as a scalable amplifier solution. There's still just this one pesky problem, which is that it's, uh, it's an oscillator. But that's a problem that we can solve. We have to remember that there's a duality between oscillators and amplifiers. Any ring oscillator can be stabilized. It's really just a matter of putting the poles in the system in the right place such that we can generate a positive phase margin. So to transform a ring oscillator into a so-called ring amplifier, which is stable, uh, we need to consider the poles in the system, P1, P2, and P3. Uh, ultimately, to stabilize, we want to push one of these poles to a sufficiently low frequency compared to the other two, such that we can generate a positive phase margin. Uh, we have different options for how to do this. One option is to try to stabilize by making an internal pole dominant. Another option is to try to make the external pole dominant. Now, in older technologies uh, and you know, more conventional op-amps, generally the approach for multi-stage amplifiers is to stabilize with an internal pole. Uh, but this comes at a severe uh, efficiency and speed penalty. Um, so why did people do that? Well, in older technologies, the parasitics that you see at your internal molds are going to be kind of on the same order of magnitude as the external, uh, external um, 
uh, load capacitance. Um, as we've scaled uh, deeper and deeper into nanoscale CMOS, that's not really the case anymore. You can have internal nodes with very small amounts of parasitics, uh, and yet the external uh, uh, node has quite a large load capacity still because that's sort of fixed based on other constraints like KTC uh, thermal noise requirements. So with that external pole load uh, pinned, uh, it makes in modern technologies much more sense uh, to stabilize with the output pole and try to push the internal poles to as high of a frequency as possible. And in doing so, we're able to break uh, a lot of the scaling limitations that we saw in the conventional uh, internal node uh, stabilized type of amplifiers using, for example, Miller compensation in the past. Uh, with external pole stabilization, we can actually get very good scaling uh, into nanoscale CMOS uh, with regard to uh, you know, increases in efficiency uh, because as we move to higher technology nodes, uh, we're able to uh, also boost the frequency of these internal poles uh, for the same power consumption. Now, it turns out that we can do even better than that. In a very conventional, you know, class A type biased amplifier, uh, the pole configuration and, uh, you know, spacing of P3 to P1 and P2 is going to be statically defined, uh, or at least as much as possible. In a ring amplifier, it's a much more dynamic system. And in the initial uh, charging state, uh, the poles will be uh, spaced much tighter, such that probably, in fact, it will be even an unstable oscillator type of system with a negative phase margin, uh, but a very high bandwidth, and so uh, very fast operation. As a result of the dynamic behavior in the system, uh, that external pole will be pushed down towards a lower frequency, and when properly designed in the steady state, it will land at a point where you have a positive phase margin and can have high precision steady state settling. But we have to be careful here because actually the AC analysis that I'm talking about so far uh, is really only giving us a small snapshot of the picture. Remember that an AC analysis is a linearization around a specific bias point. But in this system, we're dealing with large signal transient, uh, you know, DC bias type signals uh, that are that are constantly changing. Uh, and so actually things like AC phase margin only tell us a small fraction of the total story. I think that a really nice example of this actually is found in this paper by Yong Lim uh, in 2015, uh, where he shows a plot of a quote unquote stable ring amp um, with 73 degrees phase margin, and yet in his system, uh, it's obviously oscillating nonetheless. Uh, so um, AC analysis uh, is helpful in some ways for looking at steady state behavior, but actually in a ring amp, you have to really pay more attention to how do we actually get to steady state and do we ever actually manage to lock into some stable uh, bias uh, point where, where this AC information uh, has real meaning. Um, so the, uh, the full understanding of a ring amp and also in the design and analysis of one, you absolutely do need to consider the DC and transient effects that are happening. And it's fundamentally a transient based uh, uh, method of operation and uh, sort of understanding and mindset that you need to bring to the problem. With that in mind, let's now take a deeper look at how uh, dynamic large signal stabilization and feedback mechanisms in a ring amplifier allow us to go from any initial condition and transition from a potentially unstable configuration into a stable uh, steady state configuration. Uh, the ring amplifier that I show here is kind of the classical uh, ring amplifier that was first proposed. There's, of course, been many other structures that have been proposed in subsequent years, uh, but I think this original one still works quite well as a teaching example, so we'll use that uh, here for now. Uh, fundamentally, um, the common characteristic that we see here and in all uh, ring amplifiers uh, in some shape or form is... Uh, a uh, splitting of the signal uh, within the ring amp structure uh, such that the output transistors of the ring amp are going to see uh, a different uh, version of the signal uh, propagating through the structure. See how the signal splitting leads to uh, dynamic large signal stabilization. Let's run a simulation of that ring amp structure uh, within that switch capacitor feedback network. 
Here we have uh, Vn in blue, and the output of the first stage uh, of the ring amp in red, the input to the uh, PMOS uh, output transistor in dotted black, and the input to the NMOS output transistor in dashed black. Now, in this initial uh, example or simulation here, uh, we have a dead zone of zero millivolts. So this VDZ here uh, is programming an offset onto these capacitors, and that offset is going to be zero. So functionally, we still have a three inverter ring oscillator here uh, because there's no difference uh, in the signal propagation through these two paths. And uh, both output transistors are going to see functionally exactly the same signals on their gates. But as the programmed offset becomes non-zero, uh, the gates of the output transistors in the ring amp are going to see different signals, and this is going to affect the transient operation that we observe. And critically, uh, with some sufficiently large voltage programmed onto those offsetting capacitors, uh, the ring amp will actually be able to transition from an unstable configuration and then actually lock and stabilize into a, a stable uh, and constant steady state. And as we increase the programmed offset that we store into those capacitors, uh, the degree of stability increases as well. Here we are with an even larger programmed offset and even more stability. And finally, a biasing condition where the ring amp becomes so stable that it almost immediately locks into a steady state condition. We can break the ring amp's uh, transient operation down into three phases. The first is the initial slewing phase. In this initial phase, there's going to be a fairly large input signal that still needs to be settled by the feedback. And through the gain of the ring amp, uh, this will lead to a very large uh, rail-to-rail -rail, uh, inverter swings and a uh, maximum uh, overdrive bias on one of these transistors, but not both. In other words, in this mode, the ring amp operates like a bidirectional switchable current source, where you have two comparators which represent the front gain stages of the ring amp, and two current sources, which represent the PMOS and the NMOS transistor of the output stage. One of these will be selected and will drive with maximum overdrive uh, current onto the load capacitance. Following slewing, we enter into a stabilization phase where dynamic large signal feedback mechanisms force the ring amplifier into a stable configuration. Let's take a closer look at how this dynamic stabilization works for the given structure. Starting with a transient signal at the input, as it passes through the gain of the first stage inverter, and then is shifted by different offsets on these offsetting caps, when they pass through the gain of the second stage inverters, they're going to appear on the gates of the PMOS and NMOS outputs substantially different from each other. We can see this behavior also in the example uh, simulation, where again, Recall the blue line is the input of the ring amp in feedback. The red waveform is the output of the first stage. And then the dotted uh, black line is the um, bias, the gate bias of the PMOS output transistor. And the dashed black line is the bias of the NMOS transistor. Now, notice how these peaks uh, descend uh, and converge and pinch off the gate biases or the overdrive of the output transistors in this waveform. This is the critical uh, feedback mechanism that stabilizes the ring amp. It starts when on some given oscillation period for a given you know, offsetting value on these capacitors and bias condition, the average overdrive voltage is less on this oscillation period than it was on the previous oscillation period. And that means that there will be a proportional reduction in output current flowing from that transistor onto the load capacitor. And that then means that there will be a smaller amplitude of oscillation uh, at the output compared to the previous cycle. And when it feeds back to the input, it'll also mean a reduced oscillation amp amplitude at the input of the ring amp. Then this will continue to feed back each cycle. On the next cycle, uh, it will be an even smaller overdrive and even less current and even less amplitude and then so on and so forth. So the example that I've shown so far is a fairly old school example. It's a class B style ring amp, uh, which fully cuts off its uh, output in the steady state. 
Uh, and it's also simulated in a fairly old technology, 0.18 micron CMOS. Uh, let's took, take a look here at uh, a more modern example, a uh, class AB style ring amp that doesn't fully cut off its output in the steady state and then simulated in a 16 nanometer FinFET CMOS. It's basically the same story and the fundamental stabilization mechanism is the same even though uh, the architecture is different. Uh, as we can see. Now, the specific way that this architecture functions, we're going to get back to that later in the talk. Uh, but the main thing to notice here uh, for the moment is that uh, even though we have you know, much smoother curves uh, that we see on the internal nodes and a stabilization point that actually has a non-zero uh, bias where these output transistors are not fully cut off, uh, the same basic principle applies of this progressive reduction in the overdrive voltage of the output transistors, which dynamically forces the output pole of the ring amp towards a lower stabilizing frequency. Now, another thing to notice here is that in addition to the internal stabilization mechanisms of the structure affecting stability, also the output voltage that the ring amp needs to settle to is itself uh, an important factor that determines uh, how uh, well it stabilizes or how rapidly it stabilizes. And this is because uh, for different output voltages, there will be different VDS uh, across the drain source of the output transistors and thus different output currents that are being squirted onto the load capacitance uh, for a given um, overdrive uh, pinch off or progressive pinch off that creates stability inside the ring amp. Uh, more specifically, for larger output uh, values or larger output swings, you're going to have faster stabilization. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, for larger output values, you're going to spend more time slewing. Uh, on, the, uh, on the other side, if you have a very uh, small or mid-rail uh, differential output, um, then you'll need more time for stabilization, such as in the previous slide, but also you spend less time slewing. So this sort of cancels out in the end, it turns out. Uh, basically, the total time it takes to settle is usually about even uh, between the you know, zero differential output versus max differential output cases uh, because of the, the trade-off between the slewing time and the stabilization time, sort of uh, nicely canceling each other out. The third and final phase of operation in the ring amp is convergence into a steady state condition where the output pole of the ring amp has already been pushed to a stabilizing frequency and the internal bias nodes are all converging into some stable uh, final state. In the steady state condition, the dominant output pole is formed, which stabilizes the structure. And this is made possible by the large signal feedback mechanism that progressively pinches off the overdrive voltage of the output stage transistors such that they'll be either in full cutoff or weak inversion in the steady state. In this biasing condition, there's a number of advantages that we get out of the structure. Uh, first of all, this means that there will be a low quiescent current on the output stage. There's also going to be noise filtering that we'll get out of this, and I'll explain that a little bit more in a moment. This also means not only do you have a pinched off uh, overdrive voltage, but also as a result of weak inversion, your VDSAT requirement on these devices is going to be very small, which means that you can have a very wide output swing on your output without running into compression problems. This, as a result, also means that you can get high linearity of, out of this structure, even under wide swing, nearly, nearly rail to rail conditions. Weak inversion also means that you will be boosting the RO of those output uh, devices. So this output stage will have boosted gain in the steady state. And this also can help to boost linearity. Let's talk a little bit more about the noise filtering benefit that we get from this. Let's assume that the output transistors are in weak inversion. This means that their GM is relative to the initial state uh, quite low. And they are going to act as a filter uh, at the output of the ring amp such that whatever noise is generated at, for example, the first stage uh, of, of the ring amp, which would be your dominant internal noise source, as that propagates to the output transistors, they're going to be uh, filtered by uh, that uh, weak inversion, low GM um, uh, output filter. 
This also goes for the other side of the gate source bias uh, coming from the supply. So you can get filtering of both internal noise and uh, supply noise uh, due to that pinch off effect. And it turns out that actually with smart design, the noise in a ring amp uh, can be at least as good as that of kind of a, an equivalent op amp uh, with an equivalent amount of gain. But at the same time, the ring amp will be much faster and it will be much more power efficient. Uh, so in total, uh, for a given noise budget, you're going to definitely come out ahead with a ring amp. Now, following from this discussion of noise and the mechanism that provides filtering of noise in the ring amp, it's interesting to note that the optimum bias of the ring amp with regard to SNR or noise uh, versus THD or linearity um, are at different optimum points. So you have to choose uh, some trade-off between one or the other. We can see in this plot here, for example, uh, a simulation where we sweep uh, the bias control of the ring amp um, uh, from, a, from a less damped state to a more damped state. So on the very left, we have uh, instability, and so we have significant degradation of both SNR and THD. But at some point here, we can see stabilization uh, where the ring amp is stable and settling. And in fact, in the less damped case, we'll get the best amount of uh, settling and the highest THD. As we pinch off the overdrive voltage in the steady state more and more on the uh, output transistors of the ring amp, um, we will have some degradation in linearity, a little bit here, uh, because it's going more and more into sort of an overdamped settling regime. But at the same time, as we increase that bias, we're getting more and more noise filtering by pinching off the GM of the output transistors. So you have to choose here, depending on what you really care about the most, SNR or THD, what bias you want to choose. Okay, so let's summarize this uh, initial section where we've looked at the kind of fundamental principles with a return to a look at the ideal amplifier wish list that we're trying to check off in order to make the ultimate general purpose scalable amplifier. On the speed side of things, uh, we uh, are able to achieve uh, high bandwidth uh, settling in the ring amp due to the fact that there's a dominant output pole and high frequency internal poles. And this gives us a much better speed advantage than if we, for example, in the conventional sense, had needed to stabilize with an internal pole. On the slewing side of things, uh, we also have a uh, speed advantage. In fact, the ring amp uh, due to its rail-to-rail uh, -rail, uh, biasing of the output transistors during slewing gives us the maximum theoretical possible slewing efficiency and speed uh, that you can achieve. On the accuracy side of things, uh, due to the pinch off of the output transistors, uh, we saw that the, um, the structure is capable of nearly rail-to-rail -rail output swing without compression. And combined with uh, the cascaded uh, structure of gain stages, uh, we can also obtain a high uh, open loop gain in the structure, giving us in total uh, high linearity across a large output range without compression. So that's in terms of uh, THD, but accuracy in terms of SNR uh, then comes down to the question of noise. And as we saw, uh, the pinch off of the output transistors also gives us an advantage there uh, where uh, due to the filtering effect that it generates, uh, we can get at least as good of noise performance of an equivalent op amp, but with much better efficiency and other performance aspects. In terms of cost, uh, the area of the structure is very advantageous or very attractive because we have this very simple you know, inverter-based uh, construction. In terms of design effort, I would not necessarily say that this is a lower uh, effort than a conventional uh, design. In fact, it's probably a higher simulation effort because of the transient uh, mode of analysis and uh, verification that needs to be done. But in terms of the difficulty to the designer, I think once you get past the initial learning curve, it's not really any harder than designing an op amp or more confusing. It's just a different uh, mindset that you need to transition into. On the side of efficiency, uh, the ring amp, as I'll show later, can easily be uh, designed for fully dynamic switchable operation. In other words, you can turn it on and off very rapidly in order to save power uh, when it doesn't need to be used. And it has this in inherent class AB style operation. 
And then finally, at the intersection between efficiency and uh, speed is the benefit of performance that scales like digital CMOS. And we certainly are able to check this off, not only on the speed side of things due to the fact that the internal poles are pushed at a very high frequency as a function of the technology node itself, uh, but also um, because of the inverter construction of the ring amp, uh, we have no limitation on uh, 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 functionality with uh, supply voltage scaling as you go into smaller and smaller supply voltages in nanoscale CMOS. So far in this talk, we've looked at some of the more general principles of the ring amp uh, in terms of its uh, operation and benefits, uh, but we've done so through a very specific filter of, uh, of specific topologies and examples that I've shown you. In this section, I'd like to dive a little deeper into the different types of topologies that are possible in a ring amp and all of the kind of deeper and more advanced uh, design considerations uh, that are necessary for picking out a good ring amp topology for a given application. This decision tree shows some of the key considerations that you should uh, keep in mind when choosing a ring amp topology. Uh, dead zone embedding questions, uh, the signaling mode to use, the number of stages to uh, cascade in the ring amp, uh, the common mode feedback to use, um, uh, power cycling schemes that you should employ, and other considerations like auto zeroing and high voltage uh, structures. Let's go ahead and begin with perhaps the biggest and most important consideration, uh, dead zone embedding. Uh, to begin with, we have to decide what sort of biasing mode we want to operate our ring amp in. Do we want to do class B, class AB, or class B plus AB, so some sort of hybrid mode. For a class B style ring amp, uh, there will actually be a true dead zone uh, in the uh, stability region uh, for which uh, the output is entirely cut off and the output transistors are totally in sub-threshold. There's also some boundary region where you would still have a low enough stabilizing pole that the system would be stable uh, but uh, these uh, transistors would be in some sort of weak uh, inversion configuration. So you kind of have a dead zone region and then weak zones on the side, and anything within that region uh, will be enough to give you stability. So the benefit of class B style biasing is that it's going to be the fastest and the most stable because it's going to lock in the hardest uh, into that dead zone, uh, even if you have a high initial slew rate and high initial stability. This will counteract that with uh, a very strong stabilization feedback effect. However, the downside is that that true dead zone means that anywhere within that dead region, there's actually no conduction at the output. So anywhere it lands in there, uh, it's gonna stick and it won't settle out any further. So you're gonna have uh, a distortion in the class B uh, mode of operation. So you really can only use this up to maybe about 50 dB uh, accuracy for THD. If you need more uh, accuracy than that, then you're probably going to need to go with a class AB style biasing of your ring amp, uh, where there's only gonna be weak zone and no dead zone. In other words, for any possible input voltage, there's always gonna be some amount of current conduction on the output. And so in the plot of V in versus I out, you'll just have this weak zone region uh, where you have a stabilizing dominant output pole. The benefit here is that then you're always actually small signal RC settling in the steady state, so you get the highest accuracy where there's no distortion. The accuracy is only limited by the open loop gain of the amplifier in feedback, uh, very much as you can consider uh, the accuracy of a uh, conventional amplifier. But the downside is that it's gonna be slower because the uh, large signal uh, stabilization feedback mechanism is going to be uh, weaker because that, that stability region is narrower in the class AB style biasing. Now, it's also possible to go for a sort of hybrid approach where you have class B uh, coarse uh, charging devices in parallel with a class AB uh, fine precision settling ring amp. Uh, so uh, this has been done also in uh, regular uh, op amps, the idea to have a coarse charge in parallel with a fine charge. Um, uh, but with a ring amp, it actually works out even, uh, even more elegantly. And this is because those class B biased coarse charge devices are going to have a dead zone, which when they get into their dead zone, they're going to automatically cut themselves off from the output. 
and then leave just the class AB device to uh, settle uh, in the steady state. So there's a very elegant uh, handoff, like an inherent and natural handoff from the coarse charge devices to the fine charge device when you try to do this parallel approach with a ring amp based system. Now, once you've decided on the biasing mode that you need to use uh, based on your accuracy and speed requirements, um, then the next question is, how are you actually going to do the dead zone embedding that will give you the dynamic large signal stabilization? Uh, first consideration here is the location of the embedding. You can either put it directly before the output stage or somewhere in the earlier stages of the ring amp. If we embed directly before the output stage of the ring amp, in this case using capacitors and in this case using a resistor, this gives us the most precise control of the output stage biasing. And for that reason, it's a very good choice for class AB operation. Because for example, in this resistor case, uh, in the steady state, the voltage that forms across this resistor's terminals is going to also directly determine what the bias is on the output stage transistors and thus the output pole location as well. Uh, it's also um, good for high accuracy and linearity for other reasons, uh, because if you have class AB operation, uh, then the accuracy of uh, the, um, the feedback is only going to be a function of the open loop gain of the ring amp and uh, there's not gonna be any distortion uh, penalty involved. Uh, also for low gain technologies, this tends to make the most sense because actually class B operation is rather difficult to make if you're low on gain. And uh, the best thing if you're low on gain to do is to go for a structure that is class AB biased. So in general, uh, all of this sort of points towards this being a very good approach for nanoscale CMOS uh, technologies and is probably the most common uh, approach used in recent designs that you see being published. But of course, this isn't the only option. We also have the choice of embedding in an earlier stage of the ring amp. And for various applications, this can make a lot of sense as well. Uh, in particular, this has the advantage of decoupling the uh, stability uh, and stabilization behavior of the ring amp from the large signal biasing at the output uh, stages or, or the, the gates of the output stages. And this makes it in particularly a very good choice for class B style operation when you're going for more high speed uh, coarse charging uh, uh, performance uh, at the cost of accuracy. Now, in addition to choosing the biasing mode and the location of the dead zone embedding, we also need to decide what sort of device we want to use. As you saw in these previous slides, you have choice of, for example, a capacitor, a resistor, uh, or even a CMOS resistor. A capacitor embedding of the dead zone, uh, whether in an earlier stage of the ring amp or uh, directly before the output stage, uh, allows us direct voltage mode control, where we can program a uh, voltage across these uh, offsetting capacitors and this is what allows us to set or tune our stability condition. Uh, this in particular is, the be is best for class B style biasing, uh, for example, in this uh, structure here, um, and also for high voltage applications. And I'll discuss later uh, in more detail why that's the case. Uh, the limitation of this um, is uh, that, for example, if you go with this output stage uh, embedding uh, scheme, it's going to reduce the max possible slewing efficiency that you can achieve because the, uh, the uh, offset voltages that you drop on this capacitor will come out of the maximum overdrive voltage that you can force onto these output transistors when slewing. Uh, so there is a uh, slewing efficiency trade-off. By contrast, if you're looking to do the embedding uh, directly before the output stage of the ring amp and you do it with a resistor, you don't have this problem of dropping a series voltage in line with the gate of the output transistor. And so there's no penalty in terms of slewing efficiency when you do this. Uh, you can still swing rail to rail uh, biasing on the output transistors. Uh, in fact, um, the mode of operation for this uh, type of topology uh, is a dynamic generation of that dead zone voltage. Uh, when it's initially slewing, uh, the, um, uh, the first and second stage outputs will be forced all the way to one rail or the other and uh, select either the PMOS or the NMOS output uh, with maximum 
uh, rail to rail biasing. And uh, there's no current in that uh, in that moment of operation uh, in the second uh, stage inverter. And so there's actually no voltage drop across this resistor because there's no current. It's only in the steady state uh, when you move towards the trip point and current starts flowing through the channels of the first and second stage that there will be a dynamic expansion of voltage over this uh, resistor, which will then force uh, the bias voltage um, of the output into its uh, final steady state condition. Embedding with a fixed resistor can also have some advantages with regard to PVT robust design. Consider if either VDD increases or temperature decreases. This will lead to an increase in ID or the branch current, and this will then uh, expand the voltage across the resistor. And that is going to counteract uh, the fluctuations in the uh, bias and output current of the output transistors, uh, helping to keep I out stable. On the other hand, there are some limitations to this embedding scheme as well. It works best with a, a small uh, dead zone voltage. If you need to generate a very large dead zone voltage, you can run into problems. Uh, because in order to do this for a given ID uh, channel current, um, you need to have a large RB in order to generate a large BDZ. And this means that you're going to create uh, internal poles uh, that will be affected by the RC of the capacitances at those nodes and the actual uh, embedding resistor itself. And so this can create some pole splitting and some uh, speed degradation uh, problems uh, inside of the ring amp structure that can impact uh, speed performance. Uh, so this is uh, a factor that makes this very good for nanoscale CMOS, where you inherently have very low voltage uh, supplies that you're operating on, and so you don't need to generate a very large voltage, and therefore your um, embedding resistor can be a low value and these poles can be uh, high frequency. Uh, but if you need to go, for example, for high uh, voltage uh, style design, then actually this isn't a particularly attractive scheme. Now, it's also possible to implement uh, the uh, resistor type embedding uh, device with a uh, CMOS-based uh, resistor instead. Uh, benefits of this is, first of all, that it's uh, tunable. You can, uh, by uh, setting voltages on the gates of these uh, transistors, uh, you, can, uh, you can tune the effective uh, resistance uh, of the device. And also it's switchable, so you can switch between an on uh, state where you have uh, some resistance generated and an off state where it's cut entirely uh, and uh, it's high impedance in effect. So this makes it uh, attractive for power cycling uh, and you know, switchable operation of uh, the ring amp, um, and also uh, for optimal biasing or um, adjusting or tuning the bias um, post-fabrication. A limitation is that it turns out that this is a bit less PV2 robust than the static resistor. Uh, it turns out that um, variation uh, across PVT of, uh, of this uh, with regard to, for example, uh, temperature or supply voltage um, is going to uh, produce somewhat more variability uh, than a static resistor, and so uh, you'll need to design in some extra margin or have some sort of background calibration which can adjust the, uh, the control voltage. There's actually quite a lot of options for embedding schemes and devices uh, in a ring amp. Another idea that's been proposed is to use current-starved inverters. Uh, this is nice because, again, you can uh, uh, easily control um, the stabilization behavior and even dynamically control it during operation uh, because you have a gate bias. Uh, so uh, it works nice with analog PVT tracking schemes because we can create replica biases for this. Uh, but a limitation, for example, of this one is that it's going to tend to be slower because you're actually uh, restricting the current flow in these paths here. And so your uh, pole uh, the, the poles of the output of the second stages are going to be constrained as a result. So maybe it's a little bit less optimum from an efficiency and speed standpoint. Another option is actually just to do the embedding in the devices themselves. So in the simplest ring amp, you just have uh, three inverters chained together. And uh, if you have a low enough supply voltage, which in nanoscale CMOS you very well might, uh, that might just be sufficient enough already to create the dynamic stabilization effect that you need. And even if it's not enough, uh, you can play with the, um, the threshold voltage uh, dopings 
of the output transistors as necessary. So for example, uh, you could make the front stages ultra low VT uh, for speed purposes and then maybe standard VT on the output in order to get uh, some sort of uh, weak zone or dead zone region uh, in, the, uh, in the steady state bias point. Uh, so this can work very well if you have a low enough supply voltage in nanoscale CMOS, for example, uh, and you can probably max out the speed uh, uh, area and uh, simplicity uh, with this approach because it, it can really be as simple as just three inverters. So, so that's rather interesting, actually. Uh, limitations, uh, for sure, PVT variation, of course, now you're depending on doping of devices. Uh, so that's getting uh, maybe a little bit complicated there. Um, and of course, uh, if you have a high supply voltage, then this doesn't work uh, at all because you're just not going to be able to uh, drop the offset needed in order to push these output devices into a uh, weak inversion or cutoff. Now, the next key consideration that you want to make when selecting your topology is going to be the signaling mode uh, that you want to use. Uh, so far, we've just been looking at structures that are single-ended. And in some cases, uh, that's actually what you're going to want to be using as a single-ended structure. For example, in common mode feedback paths, uh, there's no differential signal. Um, but for the main signal path in, for example, in ADC, uh, you're almost always going to have some sort of differential signaling. So then you can choose between either pseudo-differential uh, signaling or fully differential. If we go with the pseudo-differential uh, option, uh, we can just take two single-ended uh, structures and tie them together with a common mode feedback. Uh, and the advantage of this is that you don't need to do any sort of uh, fully differential configuration where you have a current source or a couple, uh, source coupled uh, pair uh, on, for example, the input stage. Uh, and so this means that you can maintain the truly inverter-based, um, uh, fully dynamic uh, style of operation. And this can uh, lead to uh, the best speed performance if you go with the pseudo-differential approach because there's no current limiting in any of the stages of the ring amp. Uh, the limitations here is that, first of all, you have large input offsets that need to be canceled because um, the trip point of the ring amp is going to be a function of the threshold um, and uh, random offset of, uh, of the inverters in the system. Uh, and so you're going to need uh, some sort of uh, offset cancellation and storage onto, for example, here a reset switch and a capacitor, uh, in order to deal with the uh, the fact that the trip point will be a function of the of the threshold voltages of the first stage. Uh, so that adds some extra complexity, uh, and of course, also with pseudo differential, you're going to have maybe uh, some limitations on accuracy or, or at least an upper bound on accuracy just due to uh, the limitations of pseudo differential in general. Now, going with a fully differential topology doesn't necessarily mean that much modification from the pseudo-differential. Uh, the uh, later stages of the ring amp can still be the same as they were in the pseudo-differential case. Uh, it can be as simple as just tying uh, the, uh, the first stage uh, together with some source coupling and some uh, current limiting. Um, so that can uh, come with a moderate power and speed penalty, and of course you need to uh, be considerate of the headroom um, overhead that you've injected by adding these extra devices in the current branches. Uh, but uh, you're going to get in, uh, in, in trade-off um, a uh, more um, uh, general purpose and versatile structure that's going to be able to achieve the highest accuracy possible. Another decision that we have to make in the topology selection is the number of stages that we want to use. The default number of stages in a ring amp is three stages. And this still remains basically the workhorse or the, you know, your, your average uh, most general purpose uh, case for most applications. Uh, with that in mind, uh, there are some limitations that may make you want to consider other stages. Uh, first of all, um, three stages may not give you enough gain in certain technologies to support calibration-free uh, operation if you're going for very high uh, precision where you need a large open loop gain. Uh, and second of all, uh, common mode feedback uh, can be a little bit tricky in uh, fully dif differential three-stage topologies uh, where you may need multiple feedback loops in order to make sure that it's stable and doesn't have some sort of latch up condition. Now, if you're targeting a application that needs high precision and you want to do it calibration free, 
then you may need to have uh, more gain in your system than what a three-stage ring amp can provide. Uh, and then you can go up to, for example, a four-stage ring amp uh, that was demonstrated, uh, for example, in this work here. Uh, now, uh, four stages is possible, but in order to have that extra internal pole, uh, you may have uh, more challenges uh, in terms of, uh, first of all, common mode feedback. Uh, you have to be very careful that you don't have latch up uh, in the system. And also, uh, you may uh, have some challenges or uh, sacrifice in speed uh, versus power uh, efficiency trade off uh, because of the addition of that extra pole in your system. On the other side of things, we also have the option to step down to just two stages. Uh, there's some special purpose cases where this can also be useful. In particular, in any case where you want a non-inverting feedback loop uh, in a single-ended structure. For example, in common mode feedback, uh, we have uh, here um, in this MDAC a, a main signal path with a three-stage ring amp and then a non-inverting feedback path for the common mode feedback that we need that requires a single-ended ring amp. So we basically don't have a choice. We need to uh, have a two-stage ring amp structure in that case. And in the case of this common mode feedback, we don't need a lot of extra gain. So that works just fine. Uh, so for low precision applications, uh, this can find a place. Uh, but the limitation is that, of course, you're going to have uh, less gain because you have fewer stages. So if we can go down to two stages, why not go down to one stage? Uh, this is basically what has been called in other works something like an inverter-based amplifier or a class AB-biased inverter amplifier. Um, and uh, it's found in certain specialty applications and has been proposed as a scalable amplifier technique, but uh, it has a lot of limitations. I mean, first of all, the gain is going to be very low, especially in nanoscale CMOS. And it also has very low gain bandwidth, so this is not a fast structure. Uh, it has a very slow settling characteristic. Um, it has low slew rate and slewing efficiency because it has no gain in order to boost the biasing on the gates of the output uh, stage. Um, and so ultimately, a multi-stage ring amp is generally going to be both faster and more efficient than a one-stage uh, topology, uh, even though it sort of deceptively looks like the single stage would be faster uh, due to uh, fewer poles in the system. It turns out that it's not actually. Common mode feedback is another important topology consideration. The best approach to common mode feedback in a ring amp is going to depend quite heavily on uh, both the topology in terms of, for example, pseudo differential or fully differential, as well as the general common mode requirements that you have in your system, like the level of common mode rejection that's needed or the common mode uh, accuracy. A passive common mode feedback using just some capacitors and switches has the attractive benefit of being uh, quite simple and rather easy to ensure stability for. And if the uh, system specifications um, for uh, common mode accuracy are not particularly high, uh, this is often good enough. If the common mode accuracy requirement in your system is higher than what a passive uh, common mode feedback can provide, it's possible to add some gain into the loop, for example, a two-stage ring amp, uh, in order to increase the common mode accuracy. It can also lead to a larger common mode input rejection range uh, because of the gain's ability to steer more charge uh, in the loop. In the case of a fully differential topology, both a global and local common mode feedback loop is often required. For example, in this uh, three-stage fully differential ring amp structure, uh, the first path uh, of common mode feedback is a DC bias path, where uh, a DC bias charge is passed into the current sources um, of the first stage in order to set the uh, current bias condition of that stage. The second path is a fast global feedback path tied from the outputs of the uh, ring amp um, into uh, this bias node of the current sources of the first stage uh, through these coupling capacitors. And this provides an AC common mode feedback path. Finally, a third localized uh, feedback path wrapped around the first stage uh, of the ring amp helps to ensure common mode stability in the system. In order to maximize the efficiency of a ring amp, it's often possible to incorporate some uh, element of power cycling into the system uh, such that the ring amp uh, only operates and consumes power when it's needed and otherwise is powered off. 
The best solution to this tends to be very architecture dependent. So you have to think for yourself a little bit. Uh, but we'll go ahead and look at some examples starting with uh, this uh, basic uh, resistor bias structure here. Now, the naive approach to power gating a structure like this would be to put some power gating switches uh, at the source side of the inverters, either on VSS or VDD side. Uh, but unfortunately, there's some complications that come with this and some drawbacks. Uh, first of all, there's an extra switch that you need to place in the feedback path because you're not guaranteed to have this PMOS device in this example to actually cut off. So if you want to make sure it's not uh, affecting the output, you need this extra switch, but now there's an extra nonlinear resistance in the feedback path, which could uh, affect or degrade the settling performance of the amplifier. Furthermore, it has an undefined internal reset state, which may be signal dependent, which means that there could be signal dependent charge kickback uh, onto the input that could degrade the linearity of your system. Uh, finally, there's this problem of headroom uh, due to the power gating switches. And in order to make sure that the headroom penalty of these uh, switches here is minimized, we're going to want to make them large switches, which means that then we need a large clock buffer in order to drive them and we'll have quite a bit of uh, CV squared F power uh, associated with that as well. With some modifications, we can eliminate some of these drawbacks. In particular, we can add some pull-up transistors uh, into the ring amp. And in the off state, uh, this will then force all of the nodes in the system into a defined signal independent configuration. So we eliminate the problem of uh, signal dependent uh, charge uh, kickback or coupling onto the input. And also we can fully disconnect the output. Um, however, uh, the addition of those pull-ups is going to add some extra parasitics uh, onto those internal nodes, and in, in particular this node here and this node here, those are uh, critical parasitic sensitive nodes where we want to have a very high uh, internal pull frequency. Now while that last uh, topology was definitely an improvement over the first naive uh, implementation, we can actually get even better uh, with a self-resetting topology uh, as shown here. This particular topology has CMOS resistors both in stage one and stage two. And in the power down state, they will be uh, in a high impedance configuration. And it just so happens to turn out that this particular topology uh, puts all of its internal nodes not only into a signal independent state, but into a state that automatically cuts off the output. So the beauty of this is that there's no power gating switches required, and there's no pull up or pull down switches required. And on top of that, what is functionally our power gating switches in this case, the CMOS resistors, uh, those are actually um, uh, in the on state, things that we want to have a significant resistance on. So we don't need to have large devices there. We can have small switches and minimize our clock loading to negligible levels. In applications that require a small offset, we also need to consider the possibility of using auto zeroing techniques. Auto-zeroing usually doesn't come for free. It's usually going to require extra phases of operation, uh, which means extra complexity of the overall structure and uh, extra power consumption. However, some applications or topologies may require it. For example, it's common to want to do uh, some partial cancellation in a pseudo-differential topology where there's a large inverter trip point offset uh, present uh, dependent on threshold voltage mismatch between the P and N MOS. Uh, when we do this uh, sort of partial stage one cancellation uh, and store uh, the, uh, the trip point of the first inverter onto an input capacitor, uh, we also get the stage one random offset canceled for free as well. And then we just say that the, um, uh, the mismatch and, and offset due to the later stages uh, since it's input referred and divided by the gain of the first stage, is small enough that we don't really have to care about it. In the case where you want uh, really full cancellation and zero offset, uh, then the uh, input offset storage capacitor uh, shown here uh, needs to be programmed uh, with the full offset um, of the ring amp in uh, Unity feedback. Uh, but we need to be careful here because uh, the beta and load capacitance seen in this configuration is not going to be the same as when we put it into the primary feedback path. Uh, so we need to be careful when we design this 
uh, in with regard to the size of uh, the auto zero uh, capacitance here to make sure that uh, we can ensure stability uh, and also minimize the noise impact. With the offset of the ring amp stored onto the auto zero capacitor, uh, we can then uh, cancel its effect when we place it into the feedback loop. In differential topologies, you don't have this problem of an inverter trip point offsets uh, because your input uh, pair is source coupled. Uh, so you really only have to worry about random mismatch offsets in the system. And in many applications, uh, you can tolerate uh, these offsets uh, just inherently by design. However, in other applications, you may still need to do auto zero. It's also worth noting that in many cases, there can be system level methods uh, that allow us to cancel the offset of the ring amplifier to acceptable levels without actually explicitly auto zeroing it. For example, in this uh, case here, we have a pipeline SAR stage that has some sort of input referred offset of the ring amp. And by programming the opposite uh, offset into the comparator in the SAR ADC loop, uh, we can effectively cancel uh, those offsets uh, out of each other uh, in the final output residue. For the most part so far, we've been considering structures for uh, low voltage nanoscale CMOS operation. Uh, but in some applications, uh, you may actually want to use a ring amplifier for high voltage. And this turns out to also be uh, perfectly possible, uh, but some special considerations in different topologies are required. In this paper here from JSSCC 2019, uh, we can see a three-stage ring amplifier, stage one, stage two, and stage three, uh, operating on high voltage supplies. The first two stages are operating on 1.8 volt supplies and the output stage is operating on an even higher 3.3 volt supply. Now in this sort of a uh, operation mode, capacitor embedding is the best option uh, for, uh, for embedding the dead zone. And in fact, it's really kind of the only option uh, because uh, first of all, uh, from 1.8 volt to 3.3 volt, by embedding on a capacitor, it allows uh, level shifting between different voltage domains. It also allows to generate the very large delta V that's n necessary in order to create a dead zone that actually uh, uh, produces uh, overdrive pinch off in the output devices. And furthermore, uh, by coupling in through capacitors, uh, they're able in this example uh, to uh, couple in multiple output paths on the output stage of the ring amp uh, for uh, on one side coarse uh, charging class B style operation uh, and in parallel have class AB style uh, charging operation. This concludes our discussion today about uh, the considerations necessary for uh, topology selection. Uh, now let's move on to the question of having chosen a topology to use, uh, how can you optimize it uh, for a given set of specifications? So uh, let's uh, assume that you've now chosen a ring amp topology that's well suited for the application you have in mind. Uh, and uh, after uh, doing a mock-up and simulating, uh, there's some uh, performance targets that you're still not meeting uh, your specs on. Uh, we can probably break these into uh, two uh, subcategories. You have your accuracy um, uh, performance specs that you may want to optimize for, for example, THD in terms of set of linearity and SNR in terms of uh, noise. And you can have uh, speed um, as, a, as a priority for optimization, uh, which is sort of an or orthogonal uh, question. So let's start by considering um, how to improve settled linearity. Uh, the first option we have is just to reevaluate the biasing mode that we've chosen. For example, if we have more towards a class B style biasing that has uh, distortion uh, in its characteristic, then we could adjust um, our, our structure, even our topology, uh, to be uh, class AB biased instead. There's also the possibility of using circuit techniques to improve linearity in a ring amp structure. Uh, one that's been proposed uh, recently is that of dead zone degeneration. So the idea behind dead zone degeneration for enhancing linearity is motivated uh, by the observation that first order Linear gain error in many systems is often easy to calibrate with either digital or trimming. But higher order nonlinear components of gain error can be much harder to, to correct. So for example, if you only have a 40 dB uh, open loop gain ring amp, 
Um, it may be 60 or even 70 dB uh, linear uh, if you ignore the first order component and just look at the effect of the higher order nonlinearities. And uh, the idea behind dead zone degeneration is, well, let's try to make uh, the gainer as first order as possible and do this by uh, warping uh, the transfer function with regard to the output voltage of the effective open loop gain. And you can see that here on the right. We can see uh, some uh, open loop gain curves versus uh, output voltage. And uh, for different um, uh, transistor sizes of this uh, dead zone degeneration uh, feedback circuit here, uh, we can see that there's different warpings on the edges. And so how does that work? Uh, well, um, this feedback here is going to, for certain output voltages, turn on these transistors, and they're going to steal, they're going to tap out some of the current coming from uh, the, uh, the stage two uh, branch current, and they're going to tap that off and suck it into VCM or, uh, or uh, sync it. And uh, if this is sized properly, we can see that actually this feedback action can flatten out your curve uh, uh, considerably and actually uh, boost linearity by uh, tens of dBs. So this idea of dead zone degeneration was a circuit technique uh, that accepted um, the uh, limited open loop gain of a ring amp, uh, but said we can easily correct first order um, errors and we'll just try to deal with the higher order errors. Uh, so it's sort of a quasi calibration technique. Uh, the other option is just to boost your, um, the, the open loop gain of the ring amp itself so that you have more accurate settling uh, when it's placed in feedback. And we have different options for that. We can, uh, for example, cascade more gain stages, and we talked about in the topology selection section uh, about how you can, for example, make a four-stage ring amp, and actually, if you really wanted to, you could go to even higher numbers of stages. Um, and uh, also, another option is to boost the per-stage gain. So let's say you stay with a three-stage ring amp, but, uh, for example, people have proposed uh, in the past ring amps where some of the stages have cascoded um, uh, cascoded a gain in that stage. Um, people have also shown how you can uh, select uh, different uh, dopings uh, on your transistors in order to get better gain in a given stage. Now, if you need more speed, the first thing that you should look at uh, and ask yourself is, have you done the best you can to minimize internal parasitics? And this really goes back to the fundamentals of what we talked about at the beginning of this talk, of trying to push the internal poles to as high of a frequency as possible. In fact, that idea, I would go so far as to declare the two commandments of high-speed ring amp design. Uh, first of all, uh, you should never load the internal nodes uh, unless you absolutely have to or have a very good reason for why you're adding capacitance to those nodes. And you should never limit the internal currents or GMs of the devices uh, in the internal stages of the ring amp for the same reason. But in the designs that you see uh, in the literature so far, uh, a lot of people choose to break these rules. Uh, now, sometimes I think it's actually just a mistake or misconception of the designer. Um, but many times also there's a very good reason, and it comes down to that person not necessarily wanting to optimize specifically for uh, max speed. They want something else. For example, I think this is a good example from 2015 uh, where, uh, where the author uh, puts a current limiting clamp uh, on, the, uh, on the current of the first stage inverter. Uh, from a speed perspective, this definitely violates our second commandment there. Um, but from an efficiency standpoint, you can get better current uh, efficiency uh, out of the structure by doing this. So uh, there's, there's, of course, other reasons uh, and motivations um, for, for, you know, for breaking these commandments if you don't care about speed. But if you do care about speed, you really shouldn't violate them. So if you looked at your topology and decided that you meet those two commandments, uh, then you can start considering uh, circuit techniques for pushing your speed even further. And one of the most promising things that's come out uh, in recent years is that of bias enhancement. So this idea of bias enhancement, which interestingly enough was uh, independently proposed in these two different works, um, is, uh, is to 
uh, introduce additional uh, splitting of signals inside the ring amp. So we have, for example, here the dead zone bias resistor uh, that's already in place that uh, gives us our stabilization behavior. Uh, but in the uh, first stage, we have this option of adding this resistor here and then having kind of these cross-coupled uh, connections, which are then going to uh, boost um, the uh, overdrive voltage of the second uh, stage in the ring amp. Uh, so this gives us a speed advantage um, in that stage. And we can spend that advantage um, either by uh, speeding up the second stage or by reducing the size of those devices a bit and uh, reduce uh, the loading of the first stage. And ultimately, you kind of probably want to balance both of those two things to get an advantage and, and push both the stage one and stage two output poles uh, up to higher frequencies. And uh, if we look at this uh, in, for example, the, uh, the results reported in, in this work here, uh, we can see that actually, yeah, you can, act, you can, you can uh, boost your bandwidth by a considerable percentage um, by doing this trick. Finally, if you've done everything clever that you can uh, manage uh, for boosting speed uh, and it's still not enough, then uh, you can try uh, increasing the internal power. And if you just burn more power in the internal stages, then you can push uh, their uh, poles to a higher frequency, uh, which then allows you to also put the uh, external pole uh, to higher frequency as well. As far as reducing noise goes, uh, your first option is just to increase the internal power. If you burn more power uh, in the ring amp, then you can reduce the noise uh, generated in there um, and, uh, and therefore the, the noise that appears at the output. Now, your other option is to try to filter whatever noise is generated inside the ring amp, filter that as it propagates the output uh, using the, uh, the pinch off of the output stage uh, transistors and their GM reduction. Uh, so if you drop that GM, then you'll have better filtering, but of course you will also uh, pay a speed penalty because your external pull or your output pull is going to drop to a lower frequency um, during steady state settling. So there's no free lunch here, uh, but it is a way that you can reduce your noise. Uh, something that I find many people are interested in or sort of apprehensive about when it comes to ring amps is the question of PVT uh, robustness and reliability. And I think this, a lot of this comes just from the naming uh, ring amp and ring oscillator. It all sounds very unstable. Um, so I'd like to take a little bit of time to uh, talk about uh, what can be done here and, and hopefully dispel some misconceptions. So the first thing to consider uh, when discussing PVT uh, for ring amps is the role that feedback uh, plays in making our lives easier. Uh, if you compare it to, for example, an open loop amplifier, like a GMC integrator that's very popular in, in pipeline SARS, for example, uh, it's essentially the problem of balancing a ball uh, on the hill. Any, any movement in any direction means degradation in performance. Uh, there's no feedback to suppress parameter variation, so you just need to make um, a GMC which can either be calibrated in the background uh, to track or something that is inherently uh, PVT robust and has very little uh, variation across corners. With a ring amp, you have a different situation. You have a feedback-based amplifier. So unlike balancing a ball on the hill, it's really more like we still have one edge of the hill there, but we've flattened with feedback the other side. And if we push the ball uh, safely away from the edge of the cliff, um, uh, then actually we're okay. So the feedback suppresses parameter variation. Uh, of course, uh, it's only as good as, uh, as the feedback itself. So if you have insufficient loop gain bandwidth or stability to suppress those errors, uh, then, then that of course will still result in some errors. But um, the main point is that uh, feedback helps to suppress PVT variation. And I think compared to the open loop amplifiers that we see uh, commonly used today, this actually is an advantage uh, of a ring amp. So if you want to guarantee uh, PVT robustness for your ring amp, you have two basic approaches. One is uh, to uh, just make it robust by design. Uh, so in other words, a calibration free approach. Um, include extra safety margin uh, in uh, your ring amp design, give it extra bandwidth, extra stability, such that it can pass all corners, and maybe sacrifice some efficiency or speed in order to do so. So maybe you have to burn 20% more power to have 20% more margin. Uh, but this is kind of the normal trade-off that we make as designers anyway, even with conventional amplifiers to pass corners. 
Uh, you have a number of options for increasing that uh, phase margin. You can either move the internal pulls higher by burning more power, or you can move external pulls lower and, and, uh, and reduce uh, your speed. And in fact, you know, there's quite a number of designs uh, that have come out with this calibration-free approach to ring up ADCs so far, and I think they've made a quite powerful statement about what you can do. Uh, not only um, have, have these papers demonstrated uh, robustness across uh, supply variation and temperature variation, in addition to also process variation, uh, but they do it with uh, really incredible figures of merit. So these are actually three uh, ring up based pipeline SAR uh, designs. And they all have totally state-of-the-art uh, figure of merit. So it shows that even if you design with some margin and you make this thing PV2 robust, you can still uh, get a very, very good efficiencies and state-of-the-art figure of merit. So the other option that we have is to use calibration. Um, rather than putting the ball uh, safely away from the cliff, we can put it a little bit closer and use active bias control to hold it there. Uh, in addition to the obvious uh, benefit of um, needing less margin in our design and getting better performance uh, trade-offs. Um, this also means that there, there's a lot more analog design freedom opened up because you can now uh, consider topologies and circuit ideas in the ring amp design uh, that maybe aren't so PVT robust, but with some sort of background tracking are still uh, viable solutions. Uh, the trade-off, of course, is that you're going to have more uh, digital complexity or maybe analog complexity if you go with an analog control. Uh, for tracking. Uh, there's uh, only been really one, uh, one, one calibration-based ring up ADC uh, reported yet, um, but I think that uh, we're going to see more to come. And in the early uh, data that we have, uh, anyway, um, it shows that this approach also uh, can achieve uh, breakthroughs in, in the state of the art. Uh, so I think that probably what we're going to see is that both approaches of both uh, robust by design or robust by calibration are going to be something that people are going to be using in the future, uh, much like we see with, for example, open loop amplifiers, where, where both of those approaches have been uh, developed uh, to the point that they can be industrialized as well. As a final section in today's talk, I'd like to tie it all together with a practical design example. The first thing to consider about uh, design and validation of a ring amp uh, based system is that it's fundamentally a, a transient uh, system And so it means that there has to be a transient-centric uh, design process. And this is, in fact, actually not unique to ring amps. In fact, all next-gen amplifiers, uh, including ring amps, but also GMC, GMR, charge steering, zero crossing, etc., these are all fundamentally transient uh, domain uh, techniques. Um, luckily, uh, modern compute power is, is up to the task, I think. Uh, what I find is that uh, you, you, uh, if you have... Um, a decently powerful server and uh, multi-core APS uh, licenses and cadence, then that's more than enough to uh, handle the design and validation requirements. Um, in terms of methods of analysis for you know day-to-day -day, uh, design of the ring amps, uh, the first tool that you can use is just transient waveform uh, visual inspection. And in particular, uh, I like to look at the um, input nodes of uh, of the ring amp uh, because uh, these are the nodes in feedback that are trying to uh, drive to the same value. Uh, and so you get a pretty clear picture of uh, how, uh, how your slewing and stabilization and settling phases are performing, and you can, you can really get a lot of information out of those, uh, those signals. Uh, now, if you want some quantifiable uh, results or numbers that actually uh, tell you uh, what, what your performance levels are actually at, uh, then uh, one of the best ways to extract that is by uh, running um, a signal into your system um, through the ring amp and then uh, sampling it at the output, uh, whether as an analog residue or capturing it through digital quantization, uh, and then running an FFT on that. Uh, you want to make sure that you, first of all, exercise the full output swing of the ring amp, so you need enough uh, sampling periods that, uh, that, that uh, there's enough different uh, output residues that you uh, can see how it operates and how its stabilization behavior is uh, for the full range of its possible output values. Um, and also, you want to make sure that you have enough FFT points. So, for example, if you're just looking for a coarse uh, bit of information about SNDR, well, maybe you can use fewer points, but if, for example, you want to know 
uh, information about uh, linearity and see uh, what levels your harmonics are at, well, you're going to need to run more points in order to get your uh, SQNR floor uh, down low enough that the, that the harmonics and uh, nonlinearities will pop up and, and be measurable. When running these transient simulations, I would recommend going as quickly as possible towards uh, doing your analysis in an in situ test bench that's as realistic and accurate as possible to the system that you're actually going to be placing the ring amp in. So this includes not only you know, real switches in the system, but using the actual feedback factor uh, that you'll have, uh, real loading conditions, timing control schemes, um, estimates on your parasitics, any other non-idealities. Uh, all of these things can have a pretty profound impact. Uh, in fact, there's even some papers uh, that show that the switches in the system can add extra pulls and zeros uh, into your um, uh, settling behavior, uh, which in some cases you can even exploit, but in many cases can also be a problem for you. So the sooner you have an idea of how it operates uh, in the full system, uh, the better, and, uh, and, and you don't really actually know the, the performance until you get to that point. So I'm going to show you some uh, simulation results of, uh, of an in-situ test bench with a ring amp uh, structure. And the structure that I've chosen uh, is this one here. Um, and hopefully after the discussions of this talk, uh, it'll be a little bit easier to, uh, to piece together what we have. Uh, first of all, we can see that it's a fully differential structure with uh, differential inputs into the first stage and then sort of a single-ended uh, sort of construction for uh, the second and third stage. You can see that it has a resistor-based uh, dead zone embedding directly before the output stage, and that we're doing this with a switchable CMOS resistor. You can also see uh, switchable CMOS resistors present in the first stage, uh, implementing bias enhancement for better speed performance. And recall again that for this particular uh, construction, you can switch off uh, all of the CMOS resistors, and you'll automatically have a very elegant self-resetting behavior without any extra power gating switches or pull-up switches. So this is a very low parasitic uh, high-speed architecture. And finally, we can see that it, it has a multi-path uh, common mode feedback. So we can see a DC path coming in through here that charge biases uh, these gates. We can see an AC path coming from uh, the output uh, to the common mode uh, feedback uh, through, through these capacitors. Uh, and then we can see a local feedback around the first stage through these transistors here. Okay, let's go ahead and put that ring amp into our in situ uh, test bench, in this case a 1.5 bit flip around MDAC, and we're going to put some, uh, some signals in. Now, if we look at uh, one of the uh, samples that we capture, we can see, for example, uh, the output uh, uh, residue uh, being generated for a given period of operation. Uh, we can also see the X nodes, so the summing nodes, uh, at the input of the ring amp. Uh, and what we can see here is, okay, as we come out of slewing, we have uh, fairly rapid stabilization and nice settling. So this is what I would say a, a pretty good uh, waveform. So uh, in this test bench, as we're optimizing uh, our design, uh, the first key parameter that we can um, uh, play around with is the output drive strength. Uh, if we go with a smaller drive strength, we uh, uh, scale down the sizing of the uh, output stage. Um, then, of course, this will make us more stable. Uh, but and also it gives us uh, less internal loading, but it also means that um, our uh, our slew rate, slew rate will be reduced. Uh, so uh, there's a trade-off there, and we can see okay, we now have a lot slower uh, slewing, uh, but we almost immediately go into settling. On the other side of things, if we go to 2x output drive strength, well, we slew a lot faster, but our stability is considerably worse for the same bias condition. But let's say that we really do want to go faster. We really do want that fast of a slew rate. Um, well, then we have another key parameter that we can adjust. We can increase the size of the internal stages. If we burn more power there, then we can push their poles up to an even higher frequency, and we can regain our stability. And so we can see here we have that uh, extra uh, double, double slew rate at the output, uh, and yet we're still able to get stability due to uh, the power that we're uh, burning extra in the uh, internal stages. Another key parameter that we can adjust is the dead zone biasing. Uh, if we go with a smaller dead zone, then we'll have faster settling, uh, and a larger one will be more stable. So it's a pretty obvious knob. Here we have our nominal case again, uh, where we have a kind of an ideal uh, operating point that we're happy with. And if we're uh, to expand the size of the dead zone or, or otherwise uh, 
add extra pinch off uh, and reduce uh, the overdrive voltage of the output stage transistors even further, uh, well, we have really nice stability, but we can also see that we're kind of in a class B mode here. There's, there's this gap uh, where we've created an actual dead zone and it's not settling into that dead zone. So we're generating distortion by doing this in trade-off for uh, very good stabilization. Uh, on the other side, if we have uh, a much smaller dead zone where we have a lot less uh, pinch off, well, this means that our output pull uh, will be at a higher frequency now. And so uh, our phase margin is much worse and our uh, stability and settling is much worse. So uh, on the other side of things also, we have a, a problem of being underdamped. So to summarize, if we take all of these uh, key tunable parameters, um, uh, we can try to make an example design procedure. Starting with our uh, in-situ uh, test bench, uh, we can initialize uh, ring amp with kind of over-designed front stages. So let's just give extra bandwidth to the internal poles, and then go ahead and size our output stage uh, for the slew rate that we want. Uh, and then once we have that set, we can downscale the front stages uh, for power efficiency. So for example, I've found that a ratio of four to two to one uh, can usually be a pretty nice one for a high-speed ring amp anyway. Uh, and then we can iterate through uh, 3, 4, and 5 as necessary until we arrive at a design point that we're really happy with. But of course, this is just an example procedure. I mean, ultimately, uh, I think it's going to depend on a lot of uh, factors specific to your design uh, and, the op and what you're optimizing for. Um, and so, uh, so, so you're also just going to have to be a good uh, analog designer and, uh, and think uh, cleverly for yourself on this. To conclude, I'd like to go back to the very beginning of the talk where we talked about uh, diversity in circuits. And we had talked about uh, this amplifier bottleneck uh, reducing diversity. Well, uh, with the breakthroughs that we're seeing with ring amplifiers, uh, this is opening up a lot of interesting possibilities for new architectural freedoms, new applications, and uh, generally just going after ideas that maybe are amplifier intensive in a way that previously was disqualifying uh, now that's not such a big problem, and we're benefiting already from that, and you can see that in the papers coming out in recent years. So to provide a case study, uh, for example, uh, our paper at ICCC in 2019, uh, this was a direct RF sampling ADC uh, that we presented, uh, which has, uh, if you take SNDR, SFDR, uh, and, uh, and uh, power efficiency altogether, it really represents an order of magnitude improvement in the state of the art for that application space. And the notable thing about it is that we did it uh, with 36 ring amps in that system. So it's a very amplifier intensive architecture uh, compared to most approaches that people take these days. And yet we were able to uh, break a lot of records with it. Um, and so I think that that, that represents uh, well this overall point of the benefit of having uh, more tools in your toolbox. Now, if we look at uh, how uh, ring amps are helping to shape the design ecosystem, uh, we can see that uh, at the moment, it's still rather uh, uh, lopsided. Uh, in particular, it skews towards ADCs and specifically pipeline and pipeline SAR uh, architectures. Uh, but I think what we're gonna see over the next couple of years is a shift uh, into um, uh, new uh, domains and uh, new design spaces. Uh, rec very recently this year, we're starting to see ring amps uh, show up in LDOs, and people are realizing how to use those to their advantage. Uh, in Delta Sigma ADCs, we're starting to see some things coming out, and I think we'll see more of those in the future. Uh, and really, actually, the sky's the limit here. There's a lot of open space here uh, for looking at how ring amps can solve problems in a lot of circuit domains uh, that, that, uh, that, that, that's open for the taking, I think, for people who are... Uh, we're interested in, in uh, considering this. But I still haven't answered the uh, question that I posed in the title of this talk. Is the ring amp uh, the scalable amplifier that we've all been waiting for? Uh, well, actually, I should rephrase the question. The question is, is it the scalable amplifier that you've been waiting for? Uh, and I guess that depends. Uh, they're an exciting new tool, and it could be the right one for your task. Uh, there may be other solutions out there or other tools that are a better choice for what you're trying to do. Uh, that's the beauty of circuit diversity. Uh, so think about it uh, and I think decide for yourself.
And with that, I conclude my talk, and I thank you very much for your time and attention. Great, uh, great. Thank you very much for a very uh, exciting talk. Uh, very, uh, very uh, nice talk. I think now uh, we are in the Q&A session. Uh, so for the audience, so if you want to ask a question, uh, please post your question on the bulletin board because like you cannot speak. So uh, the, the only way you can ask a question is to put, the, put, up, put it on the bulletin board and then I'll ask the question uh, for you. Okay. Uh, so since there hasn't been a, a question posted yet, let me ask the question uh, uh, first. So if we go to, let's say, the slide of 40, uh, when you talk about linearity, so Ben, uh, so ben are, are, you, uh, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you share your screen uh, if you can? Yes, we'll I think I'm with... sharing right now. Uh, I not seeing your okay great now it's coming yeah so let me go to uh, yes yeah, slide 40 and you show this very interesting graph that as the ring and bias control increases um the linearity actually becomes lower right thd so i'm interested is this due to like basically uh, like it hasn't completely settled uh is that the reason or uh why it's like as the linearity decreases as the ring and bias control go beyond let's say 10 uh, zero millivolts yeah, exactly. That's it. Um, so, so what what we're looking at here? Uh, do you do you also see my uh, pointer? If I put on the laser pointer, do you see that or no? I can see your cursor. No. Okay, I'll I'll skip yeah, the pointer. But um, your mouse, you can see it. You can't. Uh, you can see your mouse. mouse. It's it's visible. Okay, my mouse. Okay. Good. 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 Uh, so, so yeah. I mean, if if you if you look at the left side of this, then then we're going as we go further left, we're getting more and more uh, unstable or uh, underdamped, and as we go more and more right, we're getting more and more overdamped. So basically, that that like kind of slow roll off in in THD, where we're actually starting to see a bit more distortion. Um, that's basically if we look at our simulations at the at the end in this final section. Um, for example, if, uh, let's see, uh, to adjust the bias. So uh, towards the right side there, we're seeing this sort of a thing where our dead zone is, is rather large. Uh, this is kind of the extreme case here where we're actually seeing like true class B. You can actually see it's, it's actually not able to settle in at all. But, um, but here, for example, this is a better case of like really quite over damped settling. Uh, and so, uh, the thing is, is that simulation is conducted in a fixed uh, time window. That's the key thing. So we give it, I think, in that simulation, it has 450 picoseconds of, uh, of on time. So whatever it gets to at the end of 450 picoseconds, we cut it at that. If we let it run for, say, three nanoseconds, then, uh, then that curve would actually uh, not roll off in the same way. We would, it would eventually settle into something with about the same linearity, but it's all about uh, how much settling can you get in the amount of time available? And so because of that, we see this roll off on the, on the THD curve. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, thanks for the, for the, the answer. That's very nice. Yeah, and then I think uh, while we're still waiting for others uh, to post the question, so maybe I'll ask another one. Oh, okay, great. Actually, I saw a new question coming from uh, the audience. So this is like question from uh, Shrikant uh, from Silicon Labs. They're asking a question, how does the PSRR of the ring end compare to a conventional MP? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, this, is definitely, <laughs> this is definitely a question that I get almost every time I talk about ring amps. Uh, and so I should definitely take this as a hint to, um, to really go and, and do the digging to give, to give a really nice answer, because it's clearly something that people are very interested in. Um, unfortunately, I can't say that I uh, have seen anyone publish or have, yeah, we've done, internally, we've, we've done some look at PSRR, but it's more in the context of, for example, what I talked about here uh, with, uh, with noise uh, questions. If you think of PS, you know, supply noise as, as, uh, as, as noise coupling in here through the source of the, of the output transistors, then you are going to see this, this filtering effect on it. So, uh, basically, it does have some supply noise uh, immunity, especially for lower amplitudes. But the interesting thing uh, 
um, about the ring amp is that it's it's dependent on the amplitude of, of what's coupling onto the supply. It's not class A biased. So if there's a larger amplitude coupling on the supply, then you can expect to see actually uh, the overdrive voltage on the output transistors opening up and this filtering characteristic is actually going to change, uh, I think, as, as an amplitude uh, dependent characteristic. So it's, uh, it's, it's not, uh, if you compare it to a conventional amplifier, which is much more, uh, you know, uh, uh, fixed bias and the overdrive is more, um, more tightly controlled by a bias current, uh, I think you will find um, uh, noticeable and quantifiable differences between that and a ring amp. Uh, as far as like a real deep analysis and reporting of what exactly all that means and uh, how it's better, how it's worse, um, that's, that's something that I think is, uh, it's been on the to-do list for a long time and, uh, and, and hopefully uh, people in my group or, uh, or it's really open to anybody uh, who may be listening. Also, if you're interested, uh, this, this is something that, that uh, people are certainly interested in seeing more deep analysis in for sure. Yeah. Great, thanks. Uh, so there's another question. So on, on slide uh, 54, 54. Okay. Uh, 54, and then uh, you mentioned that it's PVT robust. Uh, what about the resistor process variation? We need something to track the R and the VTH of the transistor. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, indeed, and that's always been also. <laughs> uh, you'll find that in in a lot of. Um, a lot of designs that I've personally been involved in, uh, we, we shy away from. We've actually never used the fixed uh, resistor. So uh, really the person to ask on this are, are, uh, are guys like Yong Lim uh, who have used this in every single design uh, they've, they've done. So I think uh, he's, he's, he's the one to ask about the analysis for that. So I don't know if I'm the best person to ask about how you, um, how you design around the variation on the resistor. Um, uh, but uh, I mean, we can we can see that uh, uh, from from the results that uh, that papers that have used this approach. Um, let's see. Sorry, if I can find it here. For example, this is actually um, sweeps uh, measured sweeps from. I believe this is the same paper. No, this is uh, this is the paper after. But anyway, it uses the same kind of construction with. Um, a resistor, a fixed resistor, um, with that with that variation of vulnerability. Um, in in their measurement, uh, they they do manage to uh, show still good uh, reliability. Now, of course, this is for one sample, not across the lot, uh, and I don't think that we've seen uh, data yet about how it how how the yield is in that regard across uh, all lot variation. Um, so. This is also, I mean, this is definitely a, a question and concern um, that, uh, that, that, I, that, that scares me as well. And so, um, let's see, sorry, if I can find. Um, I can find a structure. Well, here, for example, so. This is kind of one of the motivations. As I mentioned, it's one of the two motivations for going with a switchable resistor. Uh, one is that it's, you know, it's, it's quite nice for being able to do power gating and switching on and off. But also, it's, uh, it, it allows you to do um, um, post, uh, post fabrication uh, tuning. Uh, so you can do adjustments. And also, I think you know, these, the, these devices um, are going to have different uh, Different susceptibility in different different uh, corners uh, versus the uh, versus the fixed resistor, but it is itself more susceptible to variation. So there there's like this trade-off there, and if you're not comfortable with the fixed resistor approach, even though people have shown it to to work, um, there's the option to go with the the CMOS resistor, and then you get to set the resistance uh, exactly as you want using using some DAX um, in uh, in digital control. Great, thanks. Yeah, and then I think uh, uh, there's another question uh, posted by Fabio Sebastiano uh, from Delft uh, at University of Technology. The question is, uh, what does THD mean uh, in the context of a dynamic amplifier? 
Uh, yeah, um, so THD uh, in this context, what I'm saying is, um, let's see, so in this analysis section for, uh, where was that? Ah, uh, here, yeah. Um, for example, in, in this spectrum, uh, we, can, we can look at, you know, w w the THD is basically in the context of our test bench. So in this test bench, we have, of course, there's more than just this test bench. We need to actually, we have a signal generator, you know, we have a signal source that we're putting in. We're sampling the signal onto the capacitors in our switch capacitor structure. Uh, then we're amplifying the residue of whatever we're doing, whether here it's a 1.5 bit MDAC, uh, it could be a it could be an integrator, it could be you know whatever switch cap circuit you want, and then you're getting a bunch of output samples. And at the end of each amplification period, for each of the amp output samples, you can go ahead and sample the final settled value of what would be passed on to the next stage. Um, in fact, m many times we actually we test it with uh, another stage after this, and we look at the output at that stage so that we can also capture the errors. Uh, inherent in the transfer process, which is is also very helpful to see. Um, but uh, okay, that's that's uh, digressing a little bit. So anyway, you get these samples out, and you have an FFT that you can take of all of those captured samples um, that are you know r uh, related to the input signal that you put in. Um, if it's like a 1.5 bit MDAC, then you need to add in the digital bits that you uh, extracted. But if it's like a unity gain uh, uh, feedback structure, then you're just, it's just going to be a unity gain, uh, you know, signal in, signal out sort of thing. You get your FFT, and then uh, from here you can go ahead and see, you know, you can, from the fundamental, you can calculate, well, which bins are going to be uh, my harmonics. And you can say, okay, I want to pull, I want to look at the bins that are, you know, uh, third harmonic up to ninth harmonic or something. Um, and, uh, and you can look at the powers of those. And, and you could, for example, integrate those, and that would be your THD. Now, in this case here, for example, in this FFT, we don't really, we can't really pick out the harmonics. I mean, part of it is that the SFDR is so low. It's a very high linearity example where we have, you know, good settling. So this is one of our high linearity designs from one of those test benches. But um, let's say, you know, there's still going to be some harmonics there. And let's say that we wanted to see where they're at. We want to know, is it 96 dB? Is it 110 dB? Well, then we're going to have to run more points because basically our noise floor, which in this case is a noiseless simulation, so this is SQNR, it's our quantization noise floor, um, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's too high and it's kind of drowning out our harmonics. So if we run a 256 point FFT, maybe 512, even 1024, well, we're going to drop our, our SQNR floor down by 6 dB each time. And then eventually we'll be able to, the, the harmonics are going to stick there and then we're going to be able to pick them out um, and, uh, and calculate our THD from that. Great. Yeah, I think that, uh, I think we, we've done with all the questions. Uh, so, uh, so let's thank, uh, the speaker once again. Thank you very much, Benjamin, for a very nice, uh, talk. We enjoyed it so much. Yeah. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah. And also,